So, in the previous videos, uh, we have seen uh, the introduction to the thermodynamic laws. We have also seen uh, units and how to write units properly, uh, what are fundamental units, what are derived units. And uh, we have also seen, um, what was the third video? Uh, we have also seen how to define systems and control volumes. And in the class, in the previous few classes, we have been looking at um, intensive versus extensive properties. We have been looking at, uh, you know, how to define the state of a system, what constitutes an equilibrium state and uh, the state postulate. So, we will review that in this video uh, and then we will move on to temperature and pressure and from there on we will move on to the next chapter. Uh, so, anyway, uh, so uh, we said uh, properties are uh, of two types, uh, they can be intensive or they can be extensive. So, if the property depends on the extent of a system or how much of the system there is, uh, how much mass or how much volume there is, then that is an extensive property and if it does not depend on how much of the uh, uh, substance there is, then it is an intensive property, right. And we said uh, some examples of extensive properties are mass, uh, volume and then energy and then internal energy and enthalpy and entropy and uh, so on, right. And uh, there were many macroscopic properties, uh, sorry, uh, extensive properties that we could define. And then uh, we said those that are not extensive are intensive and uh, we said rho density, right, internal energy, enthalpy, uh, these are specific internal energy, specific enthalpy, uh, specific entropy and uh, uh, temperature, pressure, um, uh, specific heat at constant volume, specific heat at constant pressure, uh, all of these are intensive properties and uh, how do we differentiate between extensive and intensive? We said there is a simple test, we imagine a system and uh, we say that uh, let us say a property has a value uh, is equal to P1, then uh, mentally as a thought experiment, uh, let us say that is our system, as a thought experiment uh, we divide the system into two. Uh, it does not have to be exactly half, you can just divide the system any which way you want. And if the property uh, for this portion of the system that is a part of the system is different from the property that we had for the entire system, uh, then that is an extensive property. So, if P1 changes, this implies uh, P1 is an extensive property. So, let us say we had um, 10 liters of oxygen at uh, room temperature and pressure, let us say, uh, which means the temperature everywhere was the same. And when I divide the system, the temperature at each point uh, still remains the same. And so, therefore, temperature is an intensive property. Uh, whereas, for example, the total mass uh, changes when I divide the system, right. If I divide it into two equal halves, the mass on this side will be m by 2, uh, m being the mass of the total system. So, that means mass is an extensive property, right. And we also said that uh, uh, extensive properties can be mapped one to one uh, to corresponding intensive properties, right. Um, how is that? So, if suppose I take mass, I can divide that by volume and uh, it becomes the density rho, right. And uh, I go from an extensive to an intensive variable, right. Similarly, volume, um, uh, I can divide volume by mass and I can get um, specific volume, and it has units of uh, meter cube per kg, right. And this has units of kg per meter cube, right. 
So I can always go from extensive properties to intensive properties. So I can go from enthalpy to if I divide it by the mass, I get H, which is a specific enthalpy. And it has units of joule per kg, right? And similarly, I can do um, entropy. I can divide entropy by mass, and I can get specific entropy. And this is joule per kg kel, right? <coughs> And then uh, we said that um, so is this clear? What is intensive? What is extensive? All right. And then we said that uh, uh, how do we define the state of the system? We said the state of a system is uh, the set of all we said uh, that the set of all intensive properties of a system in equilibrium is called the state of a system. State of a system is like what is your state of mind, right? So is it peaceful? Is it uh, agitated? Uh, are you like as a person? Are you hungry? Are you, um, you know, not hungry? Are you angry? Are you happy? Are you, you know, your entire state, right? All your things put together. What is your blood pressure? What is your te body temperature? Um, you know, what is your mass, what is your uh, density, all of these things put together are called the state of your system, right. Uh, so similarly, uh, thermodynamic systems are a little less complex and so therefore we take all the intensive properties of the system uh, together and call them the state of the system, right. And that system state is only defined when the system is in equilibrium, right. So we need to talk about this equilibrium. So we said the system has to be in equilibrium, right? And we said if a system has to be in equilibrium, then certain other equilibriums have to be hold, have to hold, and one of them is thermal equilibrium. And then we have mechanical equilibrium. then we have phase equilibrium and we have chemical equilibrium. Right? So what we say is that if all of these four equilibriums hold, that is if we have chem thermal equilibrium, mechanical equilibrium, phase equilibrium and chemical equilibrium, then the system is in equilibrium, right? If any one of these is not true, if we do not, for example, have phase equilibrium, then it does not matter if we have thermal, mechanical and chemical equilibrium, the system is not in equilibrium. And because it is not in equilibrium, then we cannot define the state of the system, right? Because the state is only defined for a system in equilibrium, right? Okay. So what is thermal equilibrium? Um, there are no temperature gradients. Right? So, which means that the temperature everywhere in the system is the same. So, let us say that that is my system. Then 
if I take up the pressure uh, temperature here, temperature here, 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 all of these temperatures are equal and none of those temperatures is different from the others, right. And so there are no temperature gradients, there are no, uh, it's a uniform temperature everywhere, right. Uh, or you can also call it uniform temperature. Right. And then uh, mechanical equilibrium means there are no unbalanced mechanical forces right, um, usually mechanical forces manifest in thermodynamic systems as pressure and so as long as the pressure everywhere in a system is the same, I can say that it is in uh, mechanical equilibrium. There is one exception to this requirement of um, uniform pressure and that is that pressure can vary with height. So if there is gravity involved uh, in whatever it is that you are doing, then pressure can change. For example, the pressure in a water tank is different at the bottom of the tank versus at the top, right. So that pressure variation is okay because why? Because that is not an unbalanced force, right? It is a balanced force. Why? Because if I have uh, water in a tank, then uh, the pressure here, let us call that P1 and let us call this P2. So P1 will be greater than P2. Uh, why? Because there is this, this entire water that is sitting uh, and that is adding to the pressure at P1. And so therefore the pressure P1 will be greater than pressure P2 and that is okay because that is because of gravity and that pressure variation is allowed. But anything on top of that, anything additional uh, to that pressure variation uh, would result in a uh, state where the mechanical equilibrium is not existing and so therefore uh, the equilibrium is lost, right. And phase equilibrium means that um, uh, no net change. in any phase, right. So this is important when we have phase change processes and phase change processes are very common in thermodynamics, right. So for example, if I have um, a, an enclosure uh, with this as my system and let us say part of it is liquid water. and part of it is water vapor, right. And then uh, let us say if I want to say that they are in phase equilibrium, then um, no net evaporation should be taking place from liquid to vapor. At the same time, no net condensation should be taking place from vapor to liquid, right. What happens in reality is that a few molecules of the liquid keep evaporating into vapor and a few molecules of the vapor keep condensing into liquid this keeps happening as long as they evaporate and condense at the same rate so that there is no net change, right. As long as there is no net change, I can call it to be in phase equilibrium, right. And uh, similarly chemical equilibrium. So if I have uh, a system that has many species in it, so let us say hydrogen, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, nitrogen, and ammonia and so on, right. So as long as I have chemical species that are not reacting, um, then I have chemical equilibrium. I can have chemical species that are reacting, but if their concentration does not change with time, then also I have chemical equilibrium. So for example, I can have this reaction where uh, hydrogen uh, water plus CO uh, gives uh, H2 plus CO2. So this is called the water gas shift reaction. And this goes both ways. So if I have in my system these four species, right, then I can have chemical equilibrium even though some of the water molecules and CO are combining to form hydrogen and CO2 and some hydrogen and CO2 molecules are combining to form H2O and CO as long as there is no net reaction, as long as the forward reaction rate and the reverse reaction rate are exactly equal, then I can have chemical equilibrium. So there is no net change in concentration of species, 
right? No net change in concentration of species. Right? And if all of these equilibriums are true, if I have thermal mechanical phase and chemical equilibrium, then my system is in equilibrium and then I can define the state of a system. 